Hi, I'm John F. Allen. And I'm R.J. Sullivan. And we're the Two Towers. Greetings and welcome to the Two Towers Talk Show. I'm your host, Tower One, John F. Allen. And I'm Tower Two, R.J. Sullivan. Today, we have a special guest. And that special guest is someone I've been following for quite a while. I'm excited that they are here. Uh, Stephen Barnes is here today. And if you aren't familiar with Stephen Barnes, well, let me uh, enlighten you, okay? <laughs> so Stephen Barnes is a New York Times bestselling author, screenwriter, and educator who has written more than 30 science fiction, fantasy, and horror novels. Octavia E. Butler called Barnes' Endeavor Award-winning novel, Lion's Blood, imaginative, well-researched, and well-written, and devastating. The NAACP Image Award winner is also a pioneering television writer who has written for The Outer Limits on Showtime, The New Twilight Zone, the Jordan Peele hosted uh, um, show, Stargate SG-1, Andromeda, and Ben 10 Alien Force. He has been nominated for Hugo, Nebula, and Cable Ace Awards. Barnes has lectured at UCLA, Mensa, Pasadena, JPT, taught at Seattle University, hosted the 20 hour 25 radio show for KPFK, been a Kung Fu columnist for Black Belt Magazine, which we will be talking about and been a starred speaker at the LA Screenwriting Expo. An avid yogi and martial artist with three black belts, Stephen is also a pioneer in the human potential movement, creating the groundbreaking life writing creativity system, making writers the heroes of their own stories. And we'll be talking about that today with this uh, very legendary person uh, who I'm, uh, who I'm very excited to have. I'm, I'm honored. Legend in my own mind. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for being here, Stephen. Uh, I, I'm going to gush a little bit, so just so you know. Oh, be my favorite. Be, you know, be my guest. <laughs> you know, I gush over people all the time, man. I, I, I search for people who I can gush over. I mean, seriously, uh, there's nothing I like more than meeting somebody who's better than I am at something that I, I care about. You know, I'll, I'll travel a long, I'll spend, a, I'll try, I will literally travel a thousand, drive a thousand miles to spend 15 minutes with someone who can answer the right question for me. You know, and that's to a huge degree. If there's anything that's been a, a secret in my life, it has been searching for people who are better than me and following them. <laughs> it's like, man, oh man, you can say, you can, you can, you can turn decades into days if you do that. Mm. Seriously, because the people who can who can do the things at a high level, in a higher level, then you have a different perspective on life. So like when I sought out Larry Niven as a mentor, I didn't go to him saying, I know how to write. I went to him saying, help me. You know what I'm saying? Let me humble myself. Let me empty my cup. Same thing with the martial arts training, with relationships, finding somebody, you know, a pair of grandparents who are still in love, who've been married for 40 years, 50 years. How did you do it? What, what is the truth about what relationships are? Um, and that, that's a huge thing. So I love gushing. Please go ahead. Gush. Gush all you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the, um, and, and I, I concur um, with that, uh, you know, seeking out people who have done what you have already accomplished, what you're trying yeah. to achieve and, and learning at their feet. Uh, yes. Very, um, very much a um, team effort in creativity. I think that. Yeah, I mean, it's simple, man. If you want to go to Disneyland, talk to somebody who's been to Disneyland. How did you go? How much did it cost? What road did you take? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's not complicated, but some people get their egos involved. It's like, well, you're saying that unless I've done it, I don't have an opinion worth listening to. Well, you have an opinion worth listening to. You just don't have an opinion worth me emptying my cup to follow what it is that you're saying. You know, why should I suspend my judgment if you haven't done it? If you've done it and you're better than me, then I might suspend my judgment long enough to taste your tea and I'll, I'll try this. You know, let me let me try it this way. Let me try it your way. But, you know, everybody in the marketplace of ideas has a good rap about how they know what they're talking about. Anybody can can spin a good yarn in, about that. So how do you sort out the people that you're going to listen to, considering that you have a finite amount of life and energy? 
Mm-hmm. You know, you you just you know, there's so many people who can who who talk a good game. You know, it's they're fun. But are you going to risk your life based on what somebody thinks if they've never done it? Seriously? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's also the, you know, the, the respect factor, the, uh, you know, generating relationships, I think, that are so important in this industry, making sure that people know you're the real deal and right. you have the opportunity to show where you're at so that people know what you need. It's so, uh-huh. it's so sad when you want to help people uh-huh. and you realize if you have not, before I had published, I was a writer and I would try to tell people what it took to be a writer. And they write, quite rightly said, well, you haven't published yet. Well, that's great. After I got published, people, I mean, I remember being at a party once and there were three guys standing around talking about how it was impossible to break into the industry because, you know, the, the editors were Philistines and the publishers with this and so forth. And I began doing my usual positive thinking rap with them. And they listened for a minute and they said, well, what do you know about it up in your ivory tower? In other words, before you've accomplished it, people will discount you because you haven't accomplished it. After you've accomplished it, people will discount it because they will try to take the position that you accomplished it because of luck or because of characteristics that they don't have rather than things that they have not done or qualities that they can develop. Right. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I had some questions about your philosophy and and your teaching and stuff like that. Sure. Should we kind of get that started? Because it seems like that's the direction. Uh, yeah, you whatever you like, man. Yeah, yeah. So um, you, I know that there's a, you have uh, lecturing and teaching opportunities that you've, you've taken advantage of. Now I've known like, okay, just to, to kind of take it to my level, you know, I've, I've talked to enough people and I've learned a few things. I'll occasionally write a blog to kind of help people not make the same mistakes I did. Like I learned this. That, the hard way. that is so legitimate. That is so great. Um, but I, it's never been, you know, I've never felt to a point where I, a need or where I felt legitimate being a mentor or um, no, I don't really feel I had the, the drive to, to teach the way it seems like you do. When I look at your Facebook post, I look at your blog, I, you have this entire philosophy that you're anxious to share with other people about, about, uh, you know, uh, growing and being a better person. And yeah, I just, I'm, I, I'm allergic to pain. You know, I, I, I don't like seeing people in pain and I see so much of it, so much confusion. Yeah. And I want to say, you know, if you'll give me an hour, I can prove to you that what I'm saying is true at the basic level, then maybe you'll, you'll, you know, you'll listen to me some more, but you know, you can try this. If you'll try this thing, I can help you if you're stressed out. I can teach you how to deal with stress in five minutes a day. You know, if, if you, if, if you want this, try this. So it's, it's not that I'm asking people to believe me. It's I'm saying, you know, try, will you try something for five minutes or will you try something for an hour? And then you can tell for yourself because I, my feeling is that the more that happy people, happy, healthy, loving people are not causing the problems of, in the world that, that I see so many people who, who could have lived lives of, of joy and growth and contribution. Um, and it is my obligation because of the contract that I made with my teachers, that the only mm-hmm. way that I have to pass on what they gave me, you know, that, that it is my obligation to try to make the world a better place, to try to make, you know, to try to help people be happier and healthier. Um, that that's, that's the way the world works, that the blessings that I have received from these people, you know, I didn't create these notions. I I synthesized some of them, you know, by gathering things together, but I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, when Larry Niven took me and, you know, plucked me from obscurity and gave me a chance. Yeah. I worked my butt off, but beside the, you know, that doesn't change the fact that it was a blessing beyond belief. And what can I do other than, first of all, be a loyal friend to Larry, you know, to period forever. And secondly, to help as many people as I can. Absolutely. And uh, so you do have some actual specific lectures and, and teaching oh God, yes. that are out there. You, you know, want to talk it, about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, if you go to lifewritingpremium.com, you know, there is a course. I've got several different courses, but that's our week, our year long course that I've created, you know, I've tested the life writing 
uh, idea for like 30 years. It's the idea of using Joseph Campbell's model of the hero's journey, not just to plan your life in advance or to, to uh, guide the structure of a story because it's a great plot device, but also to, to drive or model the uh, structure, the progress of creating a story or of creating your career. When you do all those things, use it to plan your life, use it to structure a story, use it to structure the making of the story, you can type, kind of take a meta position because the way I look at it is that the hero's journey is a universal pattern because it is the older people of the village telling the younger people of the village all over the world through all of time, this is what your life is going to be like. This is what life is. And, you know, they're like 80-year-old people. They've been through all this stuff. Even they can see the patterns. They're saying, this, this is what it is. You're going to be faced with challenges. Challenges It's going to cause fear. You're going to have to make decisions. You're going to have to take actions every day. You're going to have to find friends and allies and teachers and mentors. You're going to have to develop new capacities. You're going to have to deal with failure and the fear and the sense of emptiness and, and dancing on the edge of the void that comes from that disappointment. You're going to have to develop faith in something bigger than yourself to get you through those moments. And if you do those things, you can win. And when you win, you have the obligation of turning around and teaching. That, that, that pattern, that thing, the hero's journey, mm -hmm. you can use that in so many different ways. And when you do, it's like you can begin to grasp the shape. It's like you're an ant on a globe of the world. You can't see the whole globe, but you can get, grasp the curvature. You can create a, a sort of mental image. Oh, this is the structure of life. This, you know, it, I can kind of see it, kind of sort of, the way that if you understand geometry, if I give you three points, you can draw the rest of the circle. Or if I give you four points, you can draw the rest of the sphere. It's like that. Our brains can't really hold the structure of life, but we can begin to grasp it. And I think that this is why storytelling is so vital. And if you'll use the same tools that you use in writing to look at your life, I think that you are, you're, playing, you're playing a better game. You're playing a really interesting game. Yeah, wow. That's a lot to unpack right there. So you- Go so to lifewritingpremium.com. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, uh, I'm sorry, I think I talked over you. Say it again. Lifewritingpremium.com. You know what? And I think I got to go check that out, to be honest. Uh, the, I'm not having the best few weeks, which I'm not, I mean, I'm getting going into food here. Um, uh, I, I want to put it on. Let's just say uh, I've got, I, I'm, I, the, if I could have picked the weeks for us to be doing this, um, you know, you're not going to meet my best energy. No, uh, no, then that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. So, so you're, are you feeling stressed out? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Well, that's perfect, man. You know, I remember I told you that I could help you deal with stress in five minutes a day. Here is your test. Try this and you'll know whether or not I'm full of crap. I mean, seriously. I, so I, it's I'm as simple as this. Good. Take your phone. I'm, I'm, I'm deadly serious. Take your phone. Set your timer on. Are you like super stressed or you're kind of stressed? Because that'll make a little bit of a difference. Uh I guess I don't know, John. What do you think? I think super, super stress would be a bad super stress. Okay, so, so set a timer that goes off every hour. Okay. And like maybe at the top of the hour, and at the top of the hour, spend sixty seconds doing deep, slow diaphragmatic belly breathing. Go to YouTube and look up diaphragmatic breathing. It's breathing from your belly, not from your chest. Okay, it's a very specific breathing pattern, and you do that for sixty seconds, deep and slow. Low. That's what I recommend just in general is doing it once every three hours. But when you're super stressed, just do it at the top of every hour. If you will do that within a couple of days, you will literally rewire the way your body deals with stress. Now, look at me. This is important. And you need to look at this. Yes, sir. I, okay. I see so you, sir. The guy who created the concept of stress is named Hans Selye. And Hans Selye spoke about seven languages before he died. He said that if he'd been, if English had been his first language, he'd be known as the father of strain rather than the father of stress. And this is the difference. From an engineering point of view, stress is pressure per unit area. That's me pressing on this piece of paper. Can you see that? That's stress. Mm -hmm. Strain is deformation per unit length. This is what you have to be afraid of, not stress, 
but strain. Strain is what happens when your body and mind do not efficiently deal with the stresses, with the pressures. If you are efficiently dealing with it, heat and pressure make diamonds, man. That is le legitimately what actually triggers your growth instinct. So anytime the stress of life is getting to you, what you have to do is get to the center of the storm. It's, it's not, the storm ain't going away. Life does not get easy. What we get is stronger and more balanced so you can handle more and more and more things and stay calm. That's you know, what your children need from us. That's what, that's what your employees need if, if you're the employer. That's what your, the troops need if you're the general. The one who can stay calm in, under the stress is the one who is the leader. Okay, so if you will do this, it's a physiological shift that will make a huge difference. And don't believe me, just try it. And if you try it and, and, you, and you, you discover what it is that I believe you will discover, then you might want to take a look at some of the other things that I teach. Very good. Well, you know what? And we're following each other on Facebook. I will follow up and I will report back here. Please do. Uh, how it goes as well. Yeah, so, send me a personal message. Send, 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 me, send me a personal message saying, this has been my experience. I'm available on Facebook. I'm available for, I spend a couple hours a day doing Facebook stuff because that is my way of, of repaying the my teachers. I mean, li literally, that, that's, that's what I do. It, it's part of my, part of what I do in life. Well, you know, like at least an hour a day trying to serve people as much as I can. Well, very good. Well, I didn't mean to get, I didn't mean to get it all personal, but I did want to give you an opportunity to to talk about that sure. aspect of it. It's it's this, you know, the science. You know, if I'm a science fiction writer, the science I'm most interested in is the science of mental and physical development. What does it take for us to live lives of meaning and power and joy? You know, it's I it, it is. It is a science in the sense that you can perform, you can observe phenomena, you can postulate hypotheses to test it. You can formulate experiments to test your hypotheses. I perform those experiments. I publish my results and invite other people to perform experiments too. Very good. Thank you so much. I hear, I, I, I can see John chomping at the bit, waiting to get a question in here. So I'm going to pass your turn. it on to him. Well, um, you know, when I, when I read what you post, on Facebook, it's always enlightening. It's and it's always inspiring. Uh, you know, I I I know. I I look at you and some of the things when you talk about the three gates. When you are doing that, I I aspire to that. And sometimes I know that I like sometimes if you read some of my posts, you you may think you know, wow, this guy is just having it today, or he's just like you know, this curmudgeon-y type person. But at the same time. I'm trying to develop myself in a better way. Everybody, everybody hits limits, man. Everybody grouses at times. There's, you know, that's, it's recognizing that you're off the horse. It's recognizing that you're letting the stress get to you. And then how do you reintegrate? How quickly can you recognize it? And then what is your process? What do you do? You know, it's like I tell my son and he, he does something wrong. He says, I'm sorry. So I don't care whether you're sorry or not. You need to tell me what your plans are to not do it again. How do you how do you correct it? OK, and I don't know. Well, when you know, come on back and then we'll talk. <laughs> You've got to think about it. You, you know, like, let's say he lost his he lost his patience. He yelled at his mom. What are you going to you know, I'm sorry I yelled at my mom. But what are you going to do about it? I don't know. You know, and then finally, say he might say, uh, I'll breathe when I'm getting upset. I'll go in my room and I'll breathe for a minute. Great. See, that's an actual suggestion. That's that's trying to work it out. OK, um, and so everybody loses it. I've never met a person who didn't. I've been in the presence of a few people who I think might have been enlightened and, and beyond that point. But in terms of the people that I have known, no matter how elevated they were, they lose it at times. Everybody gets tired, scared, hungry, blood sugar crashes. I mean, you know, just overwhelmed. That's life, man. I don't, I'm not disappointed by that. I'm impressed by the honesty when people can say, I lost control. Not, I, 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 I look at you and I look, read your post and, and, you know, sometimes, you know, it gives me some pause and I, I start to self-reflect. And I've been doing that a lot uh, over the past year. Uh, of course, you know, I think the whole world has to some extent with oh, God, yes. going on. Um, but from a personal level, some doors are opening up for me and 
that career career doors yes fantastic man and let's I, move through those doors with power i'm excited about it but yeah. also at the same time a little nervous because yes I, know a like, burger. I don't want to mess it up you know yeah absolutely and do you want to use that fear you don't have to remove the fear do not seek to remove the fear the fear is just your body mind getting ready for performance getting ready to run or fight okay that's all the fear is it's the fire what you want is for the fire to boil your water so that it produces steam that drives your engine so it's 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 getting lined up so that the fear does what it's supposed to do in your body mind this this is the thing that i learned from martial arts you know because i had i was dealing with a lot of fear from being bullied and other stuff my dad not being there stuff like that so i was i had a lot of fear and i thought i had to get rid of that fear i thought that the fear meant that i was you know a coward or weak or this no it didn't mean any of those things it just meant that my body was saying there are risks you know there are there's danger here there's you know it, so you need to get ready so that anxiety you feel is just your your body mind saying let's get ready so it's like thank the fear fear is good in that sense it's like get let's get ready <laughs> here it is well i'm excited um and i since you mentioned the martial arts that that's so for our audience uh to know that uh when I was first introduced from a, a, a person of knowing something about someone else, when I was first introduced to Stephen Barnes, it was actually through martial arts. It wasn't through the writing. It was the Black Belt Magazine articles. Uh, and what, what, art, what art have you practiced? What do you do? Uh, <laughs> or what did you do? Uh, now I feel like a, a, a schoolboy. So because you actually asked me that question and that I don't know. Anyway, um, I started out in uh, Shell Ray Gojuru, uh, Okinawan uh, style. Gojuru, go get me, you go see Yamaguchi. Yes, yes. Yes, the, the cat. Yes, the cat. Actually, yes, absolutely, yes. And so I I studied briefly with Tang Soo Do. Uh, here Chuck at, Norris. Yes, old Chuck Norris, the uh, Korean karate. Yes. Uh, yes. And then I went to uh, Shotokan, the traditional. Yeah, uh, JKA yeah. Or, a or American Karate Association. Uh, it was actually through JKA. It was. Uh, okay, is that the Oshima or Nishiyama? Uh, Nishiyama. Okay, it, cool, cool, good man. It was, um, it was enlightening. A lot of what I was doing in uh, the martial arts was to learn to focus and to learn some uh, uh, ability uh, to get the ability I developed the ability to maintain control. But it was also during a course, a time in my life when I was bullied and yeah. I was ostracized. I was yeah. ostracized for uh, numerous reasons. And then my home life wasn't the greatest. And it was teaching me something that has stuck with me throughout, you know, my life. And although I don't, um, I don't practice uh, like I used to, um, due to some physical limitations that I have, but also due to me, you know, just getting away from it. Some life, life moves on, man. Something that, you know, I'm hoping to change. And that's part of this journey that I'm on right now, uh, the leg of this journey. Um, when I read your columns, it, it enlightened me about a lot of things. It made me feel like that there was someone out there who I could learn from, even though I didn't know you, you know, I was reading, I was reading these things and it was at a time in my life where I needed to, to get what you were saying. And that inspired me to move further into learning about who you were. And then that's when I came to Street Lethal. And I was <laughs> like, wow, not only is he uh, a martial art, uh, in, uh, a martial artist of renown, but he's also a writer too. And I was, I was looking into my writing early. You know, it was like I was writing short stories and poems. I, I hadn't thought that I was going to take this as a major career later on. Uh, I came from the um, old school of parents. You need to be a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer, especially if you're a black man. You know, that's how you get ahead. Yeah. Everything else is just fantasy, you know. 
Uh, so I put a lot of that stuff on the back burner uh, for a long time. But from they were my- trying to be sure that you'd survive. They were yeah. trying to be sure that the investment of their of, of the community in you would be repaid. That's a survival thing, man. They loved you. That's that's survival. That's that's that is no joke. You know, the, the community that can afford artists is a stable community. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they have to know that. So we've been in the position of trying to find our balance, catch our balance. So, you know, it's uh, I think that I think that everyone who grew up if you grew up with parents who understood your urge to be an artist and supported that, that's that's a phenomenal gift and very unusual. Most artists didn't get that. And it's, uh, it's been interesting, um, you know, reading and, and when I uh, practice martial arts and how it has had an effect on how I write. Uh-huh. So not only from a discipline standpoint, but from how I am able to create fight scene, you know, no having sparred, having, you know, been punched, having punched someone else, having kicked someone else, having been kicked. I know what that feels like. I know how how I react, how I reacted to those things, both on the giving and receiving end. So it helps to strengthen my writing. And I, I've had some people compliment me on how you know it is. It, it flows like a, a a movie, like it's like a cinematic type thing or whatnot. And and I I I know that it comes from that. It comes from my study of the arts. Uh, how has and I, I know I know this from my own personal um, uh, experiences with your work, but could you share with our audience how the martial arts, how you got started in the martial arts, and how that has influenced you in life, but not only in life in your writing as well? Well, uh, as I said before, I was bullied a lot um, when I was in school, but I was also taught. You know, my mother grew up in the old South, and. Uh, with lynchings and so forth. And she told me in no uncertain terms, she literally said to me, quote, unquote, Steve, if you let white people know how smart you are, they will kill you. So I went into the world with a lot of fear, you know, both from, you know, the community right around me and the larger community outside me, there was no place that felt safe. So I knew that I needed to find a safe place inside my own heart. And um, one day, I had an experience that was transcendent um, about what it feels like when you move beyond fear. And it was totally different. And I made a commitment that day that I was going to find a way back to that place. Uh, I'd always, you know, I'd fallen in love with martial arts from the time I watched the first Mr. Moto movie, you know, let alone, you know, Bad Day at Black Rock or or Blood on the Sun or, or, or Wild Wild West or something like that. I knew that there was a way that people could focus themselves to increase their efficiency at fighting. And it seemed to have some positive things about character. By the time Kung Fu came on television, I was, you know, in trance. And really, it's possible to move through the world with a sense of, of, of love and appreciation and peace, but still be safe to not be a, you know, a nerd, you know, not, not be a, a, a weakling. So uh, it was, that was one of the three things that I wanted. There were, there were three things that I wanted from life. Um, I wanted to be a martial arts master. I wanted to master writing and I wanted to master relationships. I wanted a family to love. Um, and I've been blessed to find mentors who could help me with all three to the point where I think that the definition of mastery that I like, which is to have unconscious competence at the basics of your craft and then be committed to it for a lifetime. You are on the path of mastery. Mastery is there a verb, not a noun. It's a vector, not a position. And to that degree, I think I can say comfortably, yeah, I've mastered all three of those things. And, uh, you know, it feels great. You know, it's, it, it's, the, it's a path. I know people much better than me at all in any of those things. I don't know a lot of people are better better than me at all of them. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I think I'm the best Steve Barnes out there, but hopefully other people, you know, I know lots of other people who found other paths that that are just as integrated and and more so. Um so in terms of my writing, you know, certainly, you know, discipline and focus and creativity and 
contact with my life energy, my sense of aliveness, you know, I know how to reach it. It gets, it's like a well that you have to dig a little deeper every month to get to hit the water. You know, I notice that it's not as easy for me to make contact with the emotional and physical energies that used to come very naturally to me when I was younger, but I can still hit it every day. You know, I, I still, I don't, I basically won't get out of bed until I make contact with that part. Um, so it's taught me how to focus myself. It's taught me how to trust myself. It's given me the energy that I need. Um, lots of different things. You know, it's in, at this point in my life, it's, it's just something I'm fascinated by. And it's like the question, you know, how far can I go? I don't know, but I've just recently found a new teacher who might very well be about to fill in, fill in some important gaps. You know, I have a, an understanding of writing that I think is higher than my capacities in the martial arts. I would love to, to bring the martial arts up uh, in that sense. And I may have been given, a, I may have been shown a doorway that will allow me to accomplish that. We will see, but it's, it's just, it's, it's an integral part of who I am at this point. You know, just like I don't let a day of my life go by without connecting with the people that I love without writing and without connecting to the warrior you know, within me. Um, usually, often that involves physical, art, practicing physical arts, but it always involves getting in touch with that survival drive. You know, it's, it's, it's that, you know, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to kill for? That clarity is what's at the core of the arts. The rest of it is just technique, you know, breathing and throws and punches or swords or this that that's all nice but if you don't have permission to defend yourself if you don't have clarity that you are made of the same stuff as the stars that there's no one who's ever walked this planet who's any better than you and that you have the right to exist you have the right to protect your heart you have to start with that start with with a connection between the animal part of you and the spiritual part of you, that you have a divine right, a spiritual right to exist in the world. You know, you are, you are not a fluke. You know, you, 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 you have a right to be here. That that thing is at the core of art and I actually have a, a course that I'm doing, uh, uh, that I've done and that I'm gonna be teaching more often called the way of path of pin and sword which is about the overlap between the martial and the literary arts or the the martial and the creative arts you know mar the martial arts are arts um they are e expressions of self the deep self the the you know and it's the same thing with writing that the part of you from which your ideas emerge that part of you is not your conscious mind you know, it's what Stephen King refers to as the boys in the basement. You know, it's the stuff that's going on. You know, it, jazz is what happens between the notes. Poetry is what happens between the words. Your deep, true creativity is what happens between your thoughts. Your thinking mind is not your true self. It's not, it's not, it's not the, the smartest part of you. You have to, when I say that I have a, a process, a six-step process that has never failed to produce published writers, and the first step is you write one sentence a day. You know, you write one sentence a day. That's all you have to do, and the rest is play. If you decide that you want to play and write more than that, well, who's going to stop you? But the only work you have to do is to write one sentence a day. And what you find out is that if you do that, you're disciplining, you're using the, the adult discipline to get you sitting at your computer and turning it on and thinking about your project. Now you have to write a sentence. But after that, in all likelihood, the little kid inside you is going to say, well, as long as we're here, I've got more to say. You know, and you start and it starts flowing because your fear that you can't do it has been taken care of by writing the single sentence. And now you're in it. You know, if that's all you have to do, then no matter, it's like saying, you know, well, I'm too tired to run five miles, but I'm gonna get up, brush my teeth, take a shower, you know, or get up, brush my teeth, wash my face, get into my gym clothes, put on my gym shoes, walk down to the track, walk around, you know, stretch, walk around the track once to warm up, and then I will just run a one lap. And I do that, and I'm done for the day. By the time you've done all that, you're not going to run just one lap. What you're doing 
is you're learning how your brain works. And one of the ways your brain works is what is the minimum I have to do to get through life? And you don't fight against that. Because there's nothing wrong with laziness per se, that, that urge to be maximally efficient. If we didn't have that, you know, we never would have invented the wheel. You know, people would just, you know, would just love picking up rocks and carrying them rather than using a wheelbarrow. We always look for ways to make it easier. That can get us in trouble if we industrialize so that you can earn an entire day's worth of food by sitting on your ass for a half hour. Now it's dangerous that we're lazy. It didn't used to be dangerous because you had to engage with the natural world in order to get your food. But the same thing is going to be true in relationships. You're always looking, what is the least I can do? You know, and, and my wife will still do that special thing on Saturday night. Or what's the least I can do, you know, and have my kids still get through school? What is the least I can do? What is the least I can do? As long as you, you say you don't fight against that, you say, how do I use that? And so... In the martial arts, it's what's the least I can do every day to stay on that track. It's, you know, it might just be a few minutes, but it's every day. What's the least I can do with my writing? You know, it's a sentence a day. I don't let any day go by without doing at least a sentence. Never, ever. Christmas Day, I don't care. Any day. What's the least I can do and still refine my connection, the connection of my body mind. That might be taking those five 60 second breaks during the day. You know, it's like, let me, you know, let me pause. <sighs> let me center myself. Let me breathe. How am I feeling? Let me check in. How's my body? How's my mind? How's my emotions? Am I centered? Am I okay? Oh, okay. Let me get into my life. You know, and, and, and what is the minimum that you need? And so it, Everything that I'm doing is really a different form of everything else. That that I'm I'm the same guy if I'm writing, working out, playing with my cat, watching television, driving down the street. It's the same guy. It's it's a slightly different use of the energy in every case. And if a mugger confronts me on the street, I'm still the, I'm the same guy that I was the last time I, I held a baby. I'm the same guy. I can't turn into somebody different. The martial arts aren't going to help me. Who I am because I practice those arts, what I discovered about myself, that can help me. You know, and, I, and, and it's, it's that question of, of uh, there are two core questions in life. And those are questions in the arts. And there are also questions in philosophy. And those two questions are, who am I? And what is true? And if everything you're doing is a different way of exploring those two questions, now, in my mind, you're doing the work. You know, I'm going to write this story. I'm going to write that story. I'm going to work for this television show, that television show. How do I connect with the same energy? It's good. Every situation is going to be different. So do I have to become a completely different person every time? No. It's, it's the simplicity of it. This is, this is who I am. How do I, what is this thing called Steve? And who is Steve when I pour him into this container? Who is Steve when I pour him into this container? And it's Bruce Lee, you know, be like water, my friends. You know, it's, yes. it's, being, it's, it's being appropriate, being appropriate. What is the appropriate thing at this moment when I'm talking to you? It requires a certain amount of honesty, integrity, energy. You know, it's like, well, who are you? What do you need? You know, that's one of the reasons why I asked you questions. It's like, what can I do for you? And you're standing in for the audience I haven't met. I can talk about anything I'm interested in infinitely, but is it appropriate? You know, have I accomplished something? What is the point of this communication This with a story? What is the point of the story? With, you know, in the martial arts, somebody tries to mug me. My goal is to get home safe. My goal isn't to hurt him. You know, if it's possible for me to get home safe and for him to get home safe, too, that would be the greatest, you know, the, 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 the absolute best outcome. We don't have to be enemies. He thinks we have to be enemies. Maybe I can convince him he's wrong. And I've been I've been fortunate with that. You know, I've been able to do that. I've been able to talk to muggers and, and you know, and say, I mean, I, I you want to hear my absolute best martial arts story? Okay. 
<laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this happened maybe 30 years ago. Maybe. 30, 25, 30 years ago. In Oakland, California. I was coming out of a friend's apartment at about 2 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and I'm walking to my car. And this huge brother steps up to me and says, hey, man, give me your wallet. And I looked at him and I said, what do you really want? He said, what? I said, what do you really want? I'm a human being. You're a human being. If there's something you want from me and I can do it, maybe I'd be happy to do it. In which case... Nothing has happened here except two people having an exchange. We both get to walk away from it feeling good about ourselves. So tell me honestly, what do you actually need from me? And he looked at me. He must have thought, was I crazy? Was I on crack? Did I have a gun? Didn't I notice that he was five inches taller than me and, you know, weighed, outweighed me by 50 pounds? Didn't he get, didn't I get that? And I just stood there and I'm thinking to, I'm thinking to myself, please do the right thing. Because if you make the wrong decision here, this is what I'm thinking, not, not what I'm saying. If you make the wrong decision, I'm going to hit you in the throat so fast you're not even going to see me move. Please, please make the right decision. And it was one of those moments in time where I couldn't tell you how long we stood there on the street. It might have been five seconds. It might have been a minute and a half. It was Time wasn't a factor. We were just in this place and I looked at him and he looked at me and his face cracked this mask of anger that he'd been wearing just cracked and underneath it was this scared little boy and he looked down at me and he said five dollars and I said sure and I opened my wallet and I gave him five dollars and I said take care of yourself and for $5, not only did I get to not have to hurt another human being or risk being hurt myself, because in any street confrontation, anything could happen. I could easily have fallen and cracked my head and died. It easily, easily. But I also got a great story I've been able to tell for 30 years. Yeah. It, it was, at that moment, that was the first moment when I realized that the martial arts had actually transformed me, that I'd actually become the person that I'd wanted to be. Um that I was able to not come out of fear and to stand in a place of clarity so that I could see what was actually happening with him. And from there I could disarm that bomb and nothing bad had to happen. I, I am so grateful that I was able to have that experience. That's who I wanted to be. I didn't want to be Bruce Lee or, or Chuck Norris or, 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 or Billy Jack. I wanted to be able to live my life with a sense of peace and integrity and, and love for my fellow man. That's, that's what I desperately wanted. And I got there and it's like, wow, what a blessing that is. That's, that's, a, that's incredible. Honestly, I don't, I don't even know how to read, how to follow up that, but uh, you know, uh, good on you for keeping your head and, and uh, talking, talking a guy down. Kept my heart. I stayed out of my head. Yeah. So I want to make that correction. I, I was in my center. You know, the, the, the warrior self are your first three chakras. It's your belly brain. It's, it's the, the, the dantian, the, the, the Chinese say, the hara, the Japanese say, mulha, svanasana, manapura. Manapura, as the yogis say, the third chakra, you know, like the center of physical mass. When you center yourself there, the world looks very different. The head, your head and your heart will lie to you. Your body never lies. Right, right. Uh, I, I, but I mean, no one would have no one would have blamed you if you thought, you know, what this guy has he has a different lesson coming, you know. And then you took that. That's true. And you would have walked off, and probably, you know, a different person could have made that choice and felt quite legit. Different people make that choice every day, and that's their right, and they're fine, and as long as that is in alignment with with their nature, then they have done the right thing. Yes. My, I know what my nature is. My nature is love. That's that's who I am, man. You know, that's I, I I like nothing better than to just be able to love people, you know, and to move through life. And thank God, I actually 
I actually got there. And it's like, holy crap, this shit works. Sounds like you got as much out of it as he did. I, I, I hope I, you know, I hope he got the world out of it. I hope he transformed his life. I, I, I would love to meet him again one day and sit down and buy him a meal and talk to him about what his life has been. Hmm. I wish I could do that for the bullies who hurt me when I was in school. You know, how has life been to you? You know, yeah. you know, you were doing the best you could, and I cope with it in my way and found strength. And so, in many ways, thank you for being allies on my journey. You know, I. If you love who you are, and then everything that's happened to you has been a part of it. And even though I wouldn't go back and say, well, I'm glad about racism. You know, I'm glad that, that she dumped me in this way. I'm glad that that bully kicked my ass. You know, I understand that that would be slightly crazy. But there's also part of me that if I love being who I am, then this is how I got here. What you going to say? You know, it's interesting uh, that you, you speak of, of transformation and transformative situations uh, because to segue into this, when I read Street Legal, I thought of how Aubrey Knight, the character, uh, had transformed himself or was in the process of transforming. And could you tell our audience about the street lethal novel what it what it uh okay that. so street lethal was my first solo novel and it was based on a world that i created around the woman promise in that story i'd written several other stories maybe three stories about promise before i ever wrote the first street lethal novel and she was a supporting character in street lethal aubrey knight who is the lead character, was my mirror image. Aubrey is untouchable, has 100% confidence in himself physically. And the street of the universe is what I would call two and a half dimensional. It's not really our world. It's a world in which physiology and physics don't work quite the way they do in our world, which allows me to have real fun with the fight scenes. You know, they're not quite realistic. They're 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 all they're realistic enough to be convincing in context, um, but Aubrey had all the confidence in himself physically that I lacked. I had that confidence in myself emotionally and mentally. Aubrey had to learn to be a full human being in that sense. So we're coming at the same question of how do I be a complete human being from opposite sides, and therefore I could see his wounds. I could see, and so all I had to do was to create scenarios in which he would be forced to address those wounds. Loving a woman and, and not feeling worthy of that love has to heal that so that he can be in a healthy relationship with a woman. You know, that, that is one of the major challenges in, in life, and I gave him that one. He had to accept himself so that he could be, become a leader. He's in a situation where people were looking up to him. And if he doesn't have that sense of, of his path being solid under his feet, how can he, how can he lead? Um, so he had to heal himself in order to be complete, in order for him to serve and to move to the next step in his life. And then all I had to do really was to create the external scenarios, you know, the gangling stuff, the martial arts fights and this and this, so that he could learn the lessons that he needed in order to be on that path. So, what people are responding to is the external surface of the story, which is moving from this to that to this to that situation, which Aubrey gets to be this badass street fighter. But underneath it all, it's that question, how do we heal? You know, how do we move through life? So um, Street Lethal and Gorgon Child and the third novel, Fire Dance, were all about Aubrey completing himself on that journey. And so... Uh, with various external contexts, through various external contexts. Hmm. And you say that you have a uh, fourth novel coming out in the Street Legal series. Can you it's not coming out. I'm working on it now. Working I'm working on it. On it. Okay. I have a real sense of what it is. I have a very specific what if that I've never seen anybody play with, uh, that I'm doing a massive amount of research to... Um, to integrate so that I can see what the simple story is that can then have those depths. 
Uh, in the real world, I, you can tell a simple story about a guy falling in love with the girl next door and, and trying to work up his courage to take her to the prom. There is, on the one level, it's just, you know, can he say the right words, do the right things? But because it takes place in our world, there's a massive, massive amount of information that has to do with mating and culture and technology and all kinds of other stuff that we all take for granted so that the idea of him renting a limo to take her to the prom contains stuff that has to do with the technology of making automobiles, which is just taken for granted, with the rituals of mating and continuation of the species that is just taken for granted. You know, with, you know, how people earn money in the world so he can afford this, which is just taking, you don't have to explain all those things. When you write a science fiction story, what you want is simple emotional stories where you have done all the work for the reader of creating this world. And so that they can just follow across the surface of it if that's all they want. But if they stop and say, well, what is a limo? You actually work that out or you've worked it out enough that they believe you. You know, what are the mating rituals, you know, and, and what is mating, you know, and what is sexuality and, and you know, are, are, is this dimorphic heterosexual behavior? What is that? You, whatever it is that, that you're, that is necessary for people to have a simple experience of storytelling, you need to have worked that through so that they feel like, oh, it's solid. Now, there are times when it's not really solid. You're faking them out, you know, any more than, than a magician really, you know produces a dove in his palm. You don't know the technology from which he distracted you by moving one hand rap more rapidly than the other, knowing that the eye does that and also understands that from where you're sitting, the depth of field in the box is such that you can't tell that there's a mirror in there behind which the, the pigeon is hiding. You know, the, the technology, art conceals itself. You have the responsibility of giving the audience an experience. They don't want to know about the wires and stuff like this unless they do. And if they do and you're behind the scenes or you reread the story or you rewatch the movie, say, how do they get that effect? How do they do that? Oh, there's the mat technique. They set this up. Oh, they they put the they they put the the, the pistol on the wall in the first act so it can be fired in the third. Oh, there's this. Oh, he understood this. But you cheat sometimes. You cheat sometimes. I cheated in Street Leap. There is a scene in which Promise and Aubrey are being judged by a whole bunch of, of people. And they're down in this arena and this whole group of people. And I wrote that scene and I said, Jesus Christ, how do they get out of this? I don't see any way to get out of this. I'd written it and it's like, there's no practical way to get out of this. Then I realized something. You go back and read that scene. I realized something that if I could distract the reader they would not ask certain questions. So what I did was I had a distraction go on in the stands that distracted the attention of the reader and the attention of the lead, the lead antagonist character. And when they looked up, Promise and Aubrey were gone. Viewed extrinsically, there was no way that that worked. Viewed intrinsically, I knew that if I distracted the character with which the with whom the audience identified, that the character that they would look up after their attention was distracted and say, "Oh shit, they're gone." Okay, so to understand there is a difference between the extrinsic logic, real world reality, and the emotional reality of being inside the experience is one of the tricks that we as creative artists or magicians use in order to provide the experience for the reader because the reader wants to be entertained. The reader is trusting you to take them away and take them on experience. The reader isn't really going to take apart everything you're doing if it flows properly. Right. So you can cheat if your heart's in the right place, if you've done your work, if you have your rapport. And I was laughing my ass off when I did that because I knew nobody would pick up on what I did and no one has. <laughs> Not a single person called me. <laughs> Go back and read it. It's impossible for them to get away. But they did. As far as every reader who ever read that scene is concerned, it, it, in terms of what people have said to me about the book. And you can do stuff like that in life. But I think your, your intentions have to be pure. What was my intention? To give them the best experience possible. 
And if they caught what I had done, I figured if they're smart enough to figure out what I did, they're going to laugh. You know, they're going to have fun with it. They're going to say, oh, Barnes, <laughs> you asshole. And they're going to roll on and enjoy the story. Because we both know it's just a made-up story. You know, I'm not saying this is history. I'm saying if you will trust me, I will take you on a journey. Yeah. And then we go on this journey together. And I'm going to give you the best story I possibly can. I'm going to do everything in, in my power to entertain you so that you're – I don't care about your, the money you spent doing this. I give you the dollar, you know, the five dollars, and you've got that back. But you never get the time back. And so I have, I have there's a a contract with my readers that I'm going to do the best I can. And all I'm asking is for them to suspend their disbelief long enough to enter into my world. And if they do that, by the time they close the book, they will feel happy that they read it. If it's not going to be the best book they ever read, but it's going to be the best book I could write. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I feel very similar when I'm writing my stories. It's like, you know, is everything going to be 100% accurate all the time? But if I can kind of weave my spell a little bit and if they meet me halfway on what I'm trying to do and I do my job, they're not going right. to notice that so much. As you know, if you, communicated. 100%. You know, if you take a look at the last performances of, you know, Frank Sinatra. Right. You know, or, you know, his voice was no longer perfect. Sure. But people loved being there. He's story. They'd aged with him. Yep. You know, they, under, they, un, they understood, you know, Mel Torme and, and these, these wonderful singers who, you know, later in life, they do not have the perfect voice. But what they have is the perfect presence. They're giving you everything they have. And when an artist gives you everything they have, we're prepared to forgive quite a bit. Yep. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I remember saying that, uh, I think Diana Ross was doing one of her last performances here uh, a few years. And I'm like, okay, you got to stand up and clap. It's Diana Ross. It wasn't the greatest song at that moment, but it's Diana Ross. And you, you just give that respect at that point. The Two Towers Talk Show is sponsored in part by OG Nerds, a new social media community dedicated to nerds of a certain age, 40 and over. Although all are welcome. Members are encouraged to share articles and links on their favorite nerdy topics such as animation, anime, art, books, writing, comics, manga, movies, music, sports, tech, science, TV, video games, RPGs, and more. Be sure to visit them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The Two Towers Talk Show is sponsored in part by Showtime Cinema in Mooresville, Indiana. Their friendly staff is always willing to go the extra mile to make your movie-going experience an enjoyable and memorable one. Enjoy the comfort of their new cushioned seating in their spacious auditoriums, and while you're there, be sure to stop by the concession stand and purchase some popcorn where real butter topping is an option. They're located at 300 South Bridge Street in Mooresville, Indiana. We hope to see you at the movies. <laughs> 